Welcome into Courtside Seats with Kroger, a Charlotte Hornets podcast. Here he is, Chris Kroger. All right, we're rolling on. We got another episode of our podcast, Courtside Seats, and I've been wanting to do this because it's like podcast colliding. So we're going to welcome in. Can I do this? I'll say instead of what up, Beck, I'll say what up, Low. We got hey. Zach Low with us from ESPN. I like it. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. Welcome to Charlotte. How are you? Good. I'm good. Thank you. Well, you uh, you got to behold, uh, well, this was Monday night when you were in the building at least, but you got to behold in person for the first time this season, the site that is Kemba Walker. So how about that? Yeah, you only got 43. Yeah. I missed I missed the real detonation, but I got <laughs> I got a good fourth quarter. What do you have? 23 in the 21 fourth? In 21 the fourth. in the fourth. So I got, a, I got a great fourth quarter. And it was a 21 that it didn't sneak up on you, but it just it just sort of like it just it piled up gradually. Mm-hmm. Like every play was fun to watch. But then you look and be like, wow, he's got 21. That's a lot in one Crazy. quarter. And coach was saying, like he he obviously it's different when you're coaching, I suppose, but like he watched the film on Saturday of Saturday, back Saturday night and Sunday. He said, you know, went back and he didn't even realize Kemba had sixty during the game. And next thing you know, you kind of find out. But he thought he had a lot. He didn't realize he was eclipsing fifty and then ultimately got to sixty on Saturday night. So that's the difference, I guess, between the coaches and us when we're just sitting there watching sometimes and, and taking it all in. You get I guess you kinda of get trapped in the moment to moment part of it. I guess, and you really want to win the game. I mean yeah. that's that's what everyone told me it was like because I, I was asking around about you know what are your what are your memories of the aftermath of a, a guy scoring 60 points which is like a once every other season kind of thing and everyone mm-hmm. was like hey, everyone's just mad we lost it's crazy right and, and and the other part of it I think too is you talk let's go back to Saturday right so we'll start about that he's got 103 in two games but at 6-1 the only other guy to do it at that height Alan he's, not, he's not six one, by the way. He's not, right? I, I hate to hate, he's to, say, I hate to burst everyone's bubble. He's not he's not six one. <laughs> so to do it, I mean he's really what he is at his height, to do what he did from a scoring standpoint. And by the way, I know they were playing a back to back. That should be noted. They didn't have the legs necessarily, but still to do it against Butler matched up on him all night, who could not stay in front of him, and Embiid, who's one of the best rim protectors in the NBA, adds to the degree of difficulty. But at that height, I mean it's it's really arguably never been done before in the NBA what he did from a scoring standpoint. Point. He and he's just so. I just I just talked to him for a while. It's just like the he he's just so it's like unremarkable to yeah. him. Like oh I just he just comes down runs a pick and roll. If he's got six inches of space, he just rises and shoots. It's not like it's not even exciting. It just is like calm, cool. Like this is what I do now. Do you see like shades of because I think if this is the transformation we could talk about under James Borrego, there are shades of this of Steph Curry, right? They're starting. We're shifting more towards how Steph is used to a certain degree in Golden State with Kemba, where the transition threes, right, the spot ups, the catch and shoots. That's a newer, at least the the frequency of those. There's more of those now in this system under James Borrego. He's turned into a great three point shooter, but now how he's being used and unleashed is is different. And now I think that leads to the explosion we're seeing from him. Yeah, I mean, you saw some of it for sure before, like even the off ball stuff. Cliff was doing some of that, but I. I just I'm always hesitant to invoke Steph's name yeah. as a comparison to anybody because I just think there's just such a chasm between what he does and even what you know I think Kemba and Dame Lillard are, are kind of the two closest facsimiles, but they're not even like facsimiles. They're right. just like a facsimile that's been around for a while and kind of aged into parchment paper. Just Steph is just in a different universe than anybody else. Well, and then you mix in too with with Kemba what he's got around him and that's no disrespect on anybody on our roster but to see Kemba not have a true running mate I think obviously the ilk of anybody else you know Dame's got CJ Steph's obviously got pick your choice Lots of people. <laughs> you know pick your choice with him same thing you know you look up and down the NBA the great players in this league who are playing the way he's playing they most of them have a true legit number two sidekick and you know Kemba's doing it out here with basically a different guy every night that's choosing to step up recently it's been Jeremy Lamb but yeah he doesn't have that true number one guy or number two guy beside him that can take some of the load off in some of these late game situations well, some of them have number one guys like we were just talking on the on the walk over here about you know obviously it's way too early but all NBA like would he ever make first team all NBA or who's the best point guard in the East this year whenever mm-hmm. you want and people throw out Kyrie and someone said you know Lowry is playing great in Toronto he said, is yeah, yeah. Lowry's playing unbelievable he leads the league in assists he's shooting really well but like he's the second best player on his team and they have 11 really good NBA players it's just a different the load Kemba has to carry and I am interested in and in, in I talked with him a little bit about this 
like that's it. He does a lot, and he was running around more than ever. I am interested to see sort of how his body takes this for eighty-two games because it's not easy. What he's doing is is just it's a lot of work because he attacks the basket too. It's not just hey, I'm standing out on the perimeter running off screens. He is downhill. He's attacking, and his his move. I, I talk about this move all the time. There, I don't think there are a lot of other guys, maybe nobody else in the NBA, who's mastered this move where he has the ability because of his change of pace. This is where his size is an advantage, not a disadvantage. Mm-hmm. He can stop on a dime and almost pinball himself back into the defender at the rim and then jettison himself back towards the basket, finish at the rim while doing it, while drawing a foul. I talked to him about that exact sequence of events because I just I don't see anyone else kind of finishing from these weird angles. And, and it's like he, he's so little that depending on your vantage point, he just kind of disappears, and then the ball is on the backboard. You're like, oh, I guess Kemba shot it from some from right. somewhere. Like, the, <laughs> the ball just appears and then goes in. Like, yeah. Okay, I guess he shot it. What did you think about Tony Parker when the announcement was made during the summer? Your reaction to it when Tony Parker, 17 years of Spur, four-time Finals champion, NBA Finals MVP, six-time All-Star decided he's going to join James Borrego in Charlotte. What was your reaction to that at the time? I mean, like everyone else, it was like, oh, that's weird. Like the Spurs, the Spurs suddenly lost everyone. Like, like, and Kawhi was unresolved by then, but was clearly going to be resolved. Um, and Manu was in the, in flux, and Timmy was gone, and it was like, oh my god, everyone's just like in a in a blink. But then you put two and two together with Borrego, and it and it made sense, and just sort of like the difficulty of finding a reliable backup point guard here, and and the and the hole that that, and, and then and then curiosity, like okay, so Tony, by virtue of doing this, signals, I really care still about playing. Like mm-hmm. I, I want to be an NBA player. I want to play rotation minutes. Like let's see what he's got. Let's see what he's got left. And I think maybe there was a feeling. I haven't asked Tony about this. This is just I'm I'm with you. The sense you get, what you see, his competitive spirit still on the court. You saw him hit two big shots down the stretch. When Kemba had 21 in the fourth, it was Tony, actually, that hit two big shots, too, also in the fourth against the Celtics on Monday night. But you get the sense, as much as he had his moment with DeJounte last year, he said, hey, I'll go to the bench. It's your time now, right? The spur way. He said Tim did the same thing. It was his time to do it. I also feel like, to your point, he felt like he had more to offer than just being a token yeah. end of the bench guy in San Antonio. He really felt like I've got a lot of game left in me. I'm sure, I'm not the guy I was five, ten years ago, but I'm still a guy that can be a helper on I a team. I believe he's only 33. It's Young. Not, yep. It's not like he's ancient, um, but yeah, but he's obviously he's NBA. This is his 16th year or something crazy. 17th, like that. Yeah. 17th year. Um, and he had a moment last night. Actually, I I got distracted by going into the Celtics locker room, and I I, I wanted to ask him or Bridges. He had a moment where he at a stoppage and something good happened and there was a stoppage where he pulled bridges aside right in the middle of the court and was kind of laughing and smiling but also clearly being like what, what did you do right there i needed to do that and, and they had a long talk and it was like animated i was i wish i had i knew what they were talking about and there's been a lot of that i mean during practices during shoot arounds you know jb at times will you know handle his business and he'll trust the second team to do their thing and then he'll, you know he's looking on both ends of the court and oftentimes they'll turn around and Tony's got hands on hand, hands on one on one instruction with his guys. And JB says, you know what? He'll just sit back and, and observe yeah, and trust. Sure. And tr- why wouldn't you, right? You trust that Tony knows what he's talking about and sees things in a way maybe that you don't even see as a coach that could be really beneficial yeah. to your group. Absolutely. What do you, what do you think of James Perego and what he's installed so far? Uh, he month. he wasted no time. Like game game two of the year, game one of the year. It's like Marvin Williams is playing center. Okay, we're going. Okay, <laughs> we're we're gonna go. Yeah. You know, and now it's eased back into. I don't think we've seen any of that kind of lineup in in a while. I I'm interested to see um, how MKG gets eased back into the rotation and what kind of role they find for him. But using him as a screen and roll guy, I think was a pretty smart. Uh, adjustment that brought out the best in him yeah, and bringing that four man I think off the bench right with the energy and like the defensive intensity that he brings and the versatility now having that off the bench I think is a is a big you know bench has been down scoring wise the last couple of games I think that is tied to MKG to a certain extent honestly getting stops and getting out and running but I mean I think he's a guy that's a big reason why the Hornets have one of the better bench units in the NBA right now yeah, and between him and Hernan Gomez and you know and Bridges, yeah, you have some some pop. It's nice to have some pop on the bench. Some guys that can just come in in there with their energy, like you know Montrez Harrell is doing with the Clippers, yeah. just change games with energy. What's the biggest surprise for you? Either way, good, bad storyline, player, team through the early month of the season. 
Let me let me bring up the standings and see what um, see what pops. Because Memphis has got to be it, right? I was to say, a certain the extent, top, the top three of the West right now being Memphis, Portland, and um, the Clippers is is surprising. Um, I think Orlando is is getting in the conversation at nine and eight. Mm-hmm. Um, as a little bit of a surprise. It's not really a surprise in the aggregate, um, but it's Denver going from nine and one to ten and seven is is strange. Utah Utah's defense being like twentieth in the league, nineteenth, something like that, is um is is problematic. Those are those are some that pop out. Well, and and you're starting to see, I think, too, and this is the adjustment in the NBA. Like you see it a guy like Donovan last year, right? Such a dominant rookie year. And this is the adjustment that gets made, right? Like now not that he wasn't last year, but when it happens midseason, really after the All Star break, where you start to really explode, now teams have spent all off season looking at tape, and you're the number one guy in the scouting report. You know that also going into games. So, just the weight of being a guy. I think you're seeing a lot of guys. Jason Tatum's dealing with it to a certain extent yep. right now in Boston, and they'll make an adjustment. They're supremely talented, and they work for good. They play for good coaches. But you're seeing that I think early on. Those I'm not even going to call it a slump, but you're seeing the adjustment that gets made in the NBA for some of these talented second your players yeah improvement is not necessarily linear yeah like donovan mitchell will be better than he was as a rookie when he's 24 and 25 but that better doesn't necessarily mean you get incrementally better every single year for you uh how much fun is the nba right now style of play what's going on pace is up shots are up i know there are some people that still kind of raise their fist and scream at the clouds that this is not basketball this isn't the way the game's meant to be played but here we are. I don't know. I find it wildly entertaining every night. So I wonder what you think. Of the I game. do think it's good for the league that a team like Memphis, that teams like Memphis, the Clippers, who don't take a lot of threes, Indiana's another, Indiana, who's coming in here tomorrow. Um, I, I do think it's it's good for the league that those teams are successful, and Memphis in particular, if they can if they can hang in the playoff race, will will sort of because they play real slow and they're just going to probably get slower as the year goes on. <laughs> Um, I think that's healthy for the league because I don't think anybody – I don't think anyone – when people yell at the clouds, some of it is just yelling at the clouds about threes. Some of it is, I think, a very legitimate and one that I share worry about stylistic homogeneity, like everyone plays the same way. I don't think anyone wants to see a league where everyone plays the exact same way. And Well, you know, some teams aren't equipped to play this way too, right? Yeah. And yet they are. And a game is only 48 minutes long. Again, all this, like, the math says you have to shoot threes. The math, yeah, some of that math is, like, over a sample size of 1,000 shots. But, like, and, and over a sample size of 95, yeah, it's it's still good math. But that's still a small sample size. Like, you can win 95 possessions in lots of different ways. And I, if that doesn't change, then I'm, like, that's good. I think that diversity of style is good. What was it? We went 8 of 34, something like that, against Cleveland on that Tuesday night. We lost to the Cavs that night in Cleveland. And and coach said he counted 22 wide open threes. I watched that game. That was one of my league pass games. And I was just like, how, how are they losing this game? Cleveland stinks. They're down by 20. I mean, you yep. guys were getting killed in that game. But that also speaks to like the randomness of the three point shot at times, where Cleveland took a lot of crazy contested threes, made them. Yeah. And we took a lot of wide open threes and didn't make them. And so sometimes that happens, right? Like you get the random outcomes that happen. And the three ball seems to, you know, play to that more than than you would have had in years past. You just didn't have that sort of ability to have some sort of wild outcome with a 111 team like that, even, yeah. even in that situation at home. Absolutely. It's, it's wild. Uh, I am a big fan of your podcast, Thank okay? You. Uh, so what, what do you enjoy doing most? Can you pick one? Because you, you churn out. It depends on what's going on throughout the week. It's not unusual to, for you to churn out two podcasts in back-to-back days, uh, but your, your 10 things you li- like and don't like in the NBA is also wildly popular. So for you, what's your favorite thing to churn out every week? Um, much to my surprise, it has become um, the podcast, actually. Um, I didn't want to do a podcast at first. <laughs> the the Grant, Grantland people made yep. me. Um, and uh, now it's it's my favorite thing. Writing hurts my brain. It's just writing's hard. Hurts I've my heard brain. it's lonely too. Like when you're writing, of course and, it is. Yeah. You just have to soul. You're just like you can't. You know, it's, and all the things that we do now that are part of our life, like I, I'm, I can't check Twitter. Like I'm new. There's nothing worse than if big news breaks while you're writing a big column, because then your brain is divided. And when your brain is divided, I, for me anyway, I can't write well. Um, and 
Yeah, writing and also like I'm just like once I had a kid, I became immediately like 15 percent dumber. Yeah. So like my brain can't <laughs> like my brain is no longer equipped to like handle the the stress of writing. But you're the thing I think that you've nailed with that piece though is and and other people have started to do more of this it's just really digestible right where it's like here's an observation and then here i'm going to show you some film and I'm, here's here's some quotes and sourced information that's going to back up what i'm telling you right so here's a really interesting thing and then oh yeah here's how it looks and here's how it's fleshed out right whereas before like an old school you know piece that you would write of oh here's what's interesting it's just words right it's just words and it still carries weight it's not wrong but you give context to it i think in a way where it's like wow that's really eye opening good i hope so i'm trying was that your what was your thought when you st- when you laid out to do to uh, that whole that whole column every week what was your what was your end game did you have one no it's just try and figure out i mean when i first first started writing about the nba i did feel like one of the inefficiencies was like writing about actual basketball Mm -hmm. like you know what's happening on the court why is it happening you know why did they shoot 0 for 22 from three why did they only get 22 through like the why of basketball i thought was underwritten and as an outsider i couldn't get in any other way so there was a pragmatic element to it as well um so just you know if you can and there was it turned out that readers wanted enough readers anyway wanted to know that i think i say this all the time i think the nba has the smartest fans of any pro sport in this country we're biased. We live in this world. So yeah, I don't different. know. I don't know any other. I don't know any other fan base as well anymore. Just NBA fans and then people who watch other sports and and the NBA. But I feel like the way you can distill information down in the NBA, this is where you give them credit. They make as much of this information, yes, disseminable. You know, it, to, to disseminate it to the public as possible, even to fans. And I think that helps. Where I feel like the NFL's got this wall built up of like, oh no, you can't know our secrets. Where in the NBA, I feel like there's this freedom of information with players and coaches to a certain extent. Of, yeah, let's explain stuff, right? Like, let's give context to what's happening on the court. I don't think that exists a lot in other sports. In I don't country. know. I don't read any any other yeah. sports anymore. I don't have time. But yeah, I, I don't. I feel like baseball sort of in a different way pioneered. I mean, that was more analytics driven. But I, I yeah. feel like baseball has always been on the forefront of, you know, pitch charts and and, and yeah, sabermetrics really started yeah, it, right? And and some of that. Um, it feels really contentious with baseball, where it's like, oh, the baseball nerds, the sabermetrics nerds. I don't know there's some of that with basketball, the analytic people, oh, the analytics nerds. But I feel like even that is slowly starting to dissipate to a certain extent. As long as Barkley is on TV feuding with Daryl Morey it'll never end. And, it, it, and the Warriors, <laughs> it'll, it'll, never, it'll never quite go away. Yeah. All right. Zach Lowe, uh, ESPN. And you can, you can see every week it's 10 things I like and don't like in the NBA. And, of course, uh, the Low Post podcast, which really you just – you churn it out on the road. You do it at home sometimes too, right? New York studio. Where do you do it at? We have a studio. We have a couple studios I can use in New York. We ESPN have a couple studios I can yeah. use it on the road. They're, they're in different ways. They're well, it's – I'm telling you, it's a, every time I get it automatically subscribed to my phone, so when I get the That's push That's what I need. I don't want to get fired. I need all the all yeah. the clicks I can get. So this is, we're crossing streams with podcasts now, so go support the Low Post Podcast if you're not doing it already. But, Zach, it's good to see you, man. Welcome to Charlotte. My pleasure. All right, we're joined now by... Man, I love this guy. Baron Davis, the third overall pick in the 1999 NBA draft and uh, former Charlotte Hornet. Baron, welcome back, man. How you uh, doing? Thank you, man. appreciate it. What's happening? Is it surreal to be in an like, entirely different arena right now and see Charlotte Hornets again? The court's down that you used to play on. Yeah, I haven't seen the court, man. I'm like excited to see the court. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, one, I always wanted Charlotte to have the Hornets, you know, even when I was playing in New Orleans. Uh, I just felt like... The Hornets made Charlotte, right? And Charlotte made the Hornets, and it, it and it only made sense. So, when they got their name back for me, it was like the best thing ever. Yeah, it's just so unnatural, I think, to have that brand go to New Orleans. But you, you're one of the the interesting people in in this team's history because you were such a young star in the NBA. Mm-hmm. You made your first All Star appearance, and then the team leaves and goes to New Orleans. And the name and brand and everything <laughs> and the history goes with it. Yeah. And you guys kept growing and getting better and better. But then you go to the Western Conference too. So all that right. so it was just very surreal that yeah. you know not only did the team left, but you know I think you're one of the players. We think, man, what could have been with Baron Davis and those Hornets teams if they stayed here? Oh, man, it would have been you know like, it would have been special. I say that because when we went to New Orleans, we became an experiment. 
right? We became an experiment for the league. We became an experiment for a new city. And so all the things that was um, that was distracting us in New Orleans, uh, we didn't have that here, mm-hmm. right? You come, you, get, you know, you, you get on Tyvola Road, head to the arena, you know, you drive out to Fort Mill, have practice, yep. you know, on the weekends, go to Carowinds on your off day. Uh, you know, little things like that. Hit up the mall. I think it, uh, we knew where we were. We knew where we lived. Guys, you know, we were all in a city that was uh, geared towards sports in a sports town. Um, and I thought when I got to New, when we got to New Orleans, New Orleans was a football town. Mm-hmm. And so the hardest thing to do uh, is to present basketball in a football town if there's no basketball you know crowd there's no basketball audience and when you look at the college demographic around the area of New Orleans you know there are no major colleges so the LSUs and Lafayette's and you know uh, anywhere in the vicinity was you know a good hour and an hour and a half away and you know uh, for me it was just like start paying attention to all that I was like yeah we kind of doomed because this this is not this city is not geared for basketball. What do you remember? Because I remember this vividly. You know, I was telling you before we started, I was around, gosh, 14, 15 years old when when your Hornet, your era of Hornets basketball was going on. So I relate so much to that mm-hmm. era because that's my favorite era of Hornets basketball. And I just remember being in the building night in and night out, and especially during that playoff, those playoff runs, and 23,000 people are wearing white headbands yep. for you, Baron Davis. What do you remember about that? Like, was that uh, surreal that was to you? crazy, man. That was crazy. You know, we had the headbands, and then uh, when we started making our run, like, everybody in the arena started wearing white headbands. Yep. Then you go to the airport, they put a headband on, uh, what's the Queen statue? Yeah. Statue? Queen Charlotte. Yeah, Queen Charlotte. Uh, it was a movement, man. I, I think that's what made it fun, the momentum, uh, the camaraderie, right? That's that's a city buying into a team, a team playing their hearts out for a city, and there's no propaganda in between, right? There's nothing. I remember we used to argue all the time about the warm-ups because people are like, yo, you can't just play hip-hop. Our fans like, you know. Our they like fan, country our fans, music around Yeah, here. they like country <laughs> music and rock and roll. We was like, man, we don't care. These fans like us, we need to be hype. You know what I mean? And yeah. So that's when we really start fighting for like hip hop and the intros, and then I had to like make mixtapes, so you know, like and and bleep out, like find the songs without without the cussing words. But it was like the fans would come, and it was you know we wanted our layup lines and things like that to be a party and an atmosphere because what I figured out was Charlotte didn't have that, mm-hmm. and so if we could use the arena right and bring that festivity and that atmosphere, then the fans would buy in, and and they did they start rocking the headbands they were showing up early and you know charlotte started to turn it started to change so in 99 you come here and you're on a veteran team with a lot of star power on that team eddie mm-hmm. jones was incredible when he was here mason was still here Derek yep. coleman david wesley bobby uh bobby phils before he tragically passed mm-hmm. for you as a player though to, to come on as a young talent like you were to a veteran team where you weren't asked to do everything right away. You weren't just thrown to the fire. I wish I was. Okay, so you, but how do you how do you feel like that that went for you though? And then because you were able to take the reins the next two years, and you just you just jumped right into it. Yeah, I mean, me and Paul Silas to this day still argue about that. <laughs> so he 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 thought, hey, you need some seasoning. You were saying, yeah, no, coach, I'm no, ready to go. No way. Uh, you know, I just felt like that was just a a year of just. I could have been so much better. But, I, you know, I learned a lot. I think what it did was coming off the bench, playing behind David Wesley, I learned a lot from him. Um, and, you know, fortunate enough, he was a good veteran. And, you know, he taught me the ins and outs. But coming off the bench, it just made me hungrier. Um, but, you know, the next year it was just like I worked. I, I, I never forget I stayed after the season in Charlotte for like another month month and a half and just worked on my jumper worked on my game Hmm. worked on my game and I was like yo when I come back like this is never happening again you know it was like for the first time in my life I'm I'm not starting like it was a crazy you know it was crazy and so it was a big adjustment but you know it made me work hard it made me it put me back in survival mentality 
And when I came back the next year, David Wesley was like, yo, I played it too. I was like, yeah, for sure. So, but for you, you like, I feel like I look at you and I see where the game has gone now. And you look at like the Russell Westbrooks. I look at the Donovan Mitchells. Yeah. Heck, heck, even I look at like Kemba, what he's turned himself into. But like you were such a big body, physical guard. You were a bully. You could get to the rim. But then you added the shooting aspect to your yeah. game too. But I mean, to me, you were the first kind of point guard that could do it all. You scored, you rebounded, you assisted, you averaged over two steals a game. You, I feel like you kind of laid the groundwork for where, where the point guard game is in today's NBA. Uh, I mean, if you want to give me credit for it, I, now that I'm not playing, I'll take it. You'll take care. it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, nah, man, you know, I just think that for me, it was just all about being an original player, one that couldn't be duplicated, right? And no matter whether you have more accolades, more stats, when we match up mono and mono, you know, you're going to think different when, you know, you when we eye to eye. And, and, and from that, you know, I wanted to read define my position uh, and I think not just as somebody who could dunk right I didn't want to be a point guard who could just dunk and I didn't want to be a point guard who could just score you know I think that you know it was the passing and the playmaking and the things and the leadership that you know I was more interested in but you know it was just so happened that my game was my game and you know I, I, I knew how to use my game to uh, as my uh, to my advantage, right? Uh, but it was more about making my teammates better that I took pride in and, and, and being a good teammate. I remember being in the building for Game Six, 2001 Eastern Conference Semis against the Bucks. Obviously, the ending didn't go well. You guys go to Game Seven in Milwaukee. They win Game Seven, and then they go to seven games against Philadelphia. And Philly obviously wins, and then goes mm-hmm. on to the NBA Finals. Wins Game One. They they lose the next four against the Lakers. But what what do you remember about that playoff run? Because that's really the deepest this franchise has ever been in the playoffs. Haven't mm-hmm. been anywhere close to that since. And we were right there. You were right there, right? We were right there. Yeah, we were right there. We were literally right there. And I liked our chances against Philly. Because you guys split with them in the regular season that year, right? And we lost to them last the, uh, the previous year in the playoffs. Yeah, first round. And we had a better team. This we had a better team, and I was starting. So it was it was a whole. It would have been a whole different situation. You know, it would have been a whole different situation. Not not saying the outcome would have been different, but it would have probably been like one of uh, one of the more epic playoff battles, right? And an opportunity for me to finally like. You know, get my revenge on Allen Iverson, which I never got. And you guys did that as a six seed too. That's the crazy part. Yeah, yeah. You guys were that close. Did you feel like you wanted that for the city? They're like, hey, we want to be in the Eastern Conference Finals for the city of Charlotte. Like, how crazy would that city have been if that ever yeah, happened? Yeah, I mean, uh, it was just a momentum, man. It was just like we had a good team, yeah. and we just knew that we could win, right? And we knew how to win, and we knew our style, and we stuck to it, and. Wow, we were so close. We were so close, I think. Just a few little mental mistakes, some uh, technical foul here, some bad substitutions here, some missed uh, assignments, you know, some turnovers. Some, you know, it's just the little things that, you know, stopped us from being in that Eastern Conference Finals. Well, Baron, it's a pleasure, man. I grew up watching you, so it's great to have you Thank back. You Congrats on being our Appreciate 30th anniversary it. member team. This uh, is awesome. And welcome back to Charlotte, man. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. All right, that's episode 25 of Courtside Seats, our Charlotte Hornets podcast. Of course, if you missed any of the episodes before this, you can go back and find us on YouTube. Just search Courtside Seats. You can search Charlotte Hornets, and uh, you'll find our YouTube channel. All sorts of great video content there, including each and every episode of Courtside Seats at YouTube. You can also find us in Apple Podcasts. Just search us the same way. My name, too. You can search Kroger. You'll find us. Subscribe, and you'll get pushed every new episode of the uh, podcast. And you can also leave a review and rate us up. That way we get found easier by everybody else out there looking for some great podcasts. If you've missed anything else, you can find us at Hornets.com or on the Hornets app. We'll be back again next week. Another episode of Courtside Seats.